too late unless you're an elder. We're going to, be, we're going to keep Craig past his bedtime. All right. It's good to see everybody tonight. I just had an emergency at home. My dog ate some, my dog, you know, his beagle Labrador, and my son said she ate some ice poison. So we're uh, having to take some extreme measures to help her right now. And um, hydrogen peroxide and uh, syringes. And uh, so we're trying to. So if my phone rings, um, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to take the phone call. And I'll just pause my lesson. I sh uh, uh, those of you who are dog lovers will understand that's like a child. And uh, I don't want to lose my dog. And uh, she's an important part of our family. But I think we've, we've gotten. The treatment she needs, and um, she has, uh, we believe she has um, thrown up some, some ice poison. So we're going to make sure. So, so we're going to make sure that happens. Things always go uh, wrong when you're away from home. That's one rule about traveling. And um, I can be uh, home for 10 years, and I'll leave, and the water line breaks. And uh, I promise you that's what happens, and, uh, and uh, it happens every time. So I started turning my water pressure on. Just turn the water off, you know, when I'm gone. And um, uh, I was away uh, about a year ago. And the neighbor called me and said, Rob, get home. I said, I'm in Texas. He said, well, you got about uh, four or five inches of water in your front yard. And I said, what? Oh. You know, and he says, and it's growing. And there's a the main water line uh, right in front of your house is busted. And it's all pouring in. And uh, so... No, if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong when you're not you're not home, right? And uh, then I went to only time I've ever left my family. I went to Texas to do some video work, and I wasn't uh, there a day. And my wife calls me and says there's been a wreck in front of the house. Uh, there's a man who's passed out on the front uh, front part of the the driver's side, and uh, she says I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do I do? And uh, Oh, it just always happens, you know, when you're away from home. And uh, she calls me back and says, there's a helicopter that wants to land in our yard. They want permission. And I said, well, tell them to land in the yard. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, in any case, it's just one of those things. All right. All right. I can't tell you um, how much I appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. This is a um, uh, very important, um, I believe, um, time in the history of a church. Alan Webster, when we first did this at Jacksonville, came up to me and he said, Rob, I believe this is one of the most historic events in the history of the Jacksonville Church of Christ. He said, because I believe that in this seminar is an opportunity for the congregation to make the changes that we need to make in order to reach the lost in our community. So you definitely have an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to, to focus on the mission of the church. And I pray to our Heavenly Father that uh, this seminar will be impactful, that this will not be something you forget. This is not going to be something that just as a checkbox on a list, but it's something you'll internalize and that you'll make it a part of your culture. The most difficult change in a person's life is cultural change. We are creatures of habit. We, we do the routine thing. Congregational routine is, um, is very difficult to break. And most churches have a calendar, and that calendar is pretty much written before the year ever takes place. And so in January, you're going to start Pew Packers. In February, you're going to have the marriage retreat uh, or do some type of marriage uh, um, parenting seminar. In March, you're going to have your gospel meeting. In April, you're going to have your, uh, you're going to have your, um, your uh, I don't know, your spring party. Um, in May, your graduation banquet. In June, your vacation Bible school. In July, your Bible camp. In August, your teacher's appreciation dinner. In September, you're, you're going to have a back-to-school event. In October, a gospel meeting, a trick-or-trunk. And then you're going to go into Thanksgiving, uh, have a turkey giveaway and a holiday party. And, and you're going to throw in a couple summer series and youth events. And uh, you're going to do it again. And that's what churches do. We do it every year. And our routine, um, is, uh, it's, uh, it rarely changes. 
But at the end of the year, when we take inventory of what we've done, we have very little to show for it. We ask how many, how many souls were saved, and, um, and almost no, no, we have nothing to put on the board. And so what we want to do tonight is, is provide a, a congregational a plan. And I'm going to do it from a 10,000-foot view. I, I believe strongly tonight it is not my role, and, it is, and, it's, and it's not my purpose to provide a detailed um, strategy for the, the local church. My, my job in a setting like this is to provide you all a framework and then to meet with the elders privately and, and provide that curriculum and allow the eldership of that local church and the preacher to be the ones who provide the training that is needed to, to change the culture, not the doctrine, but the culture, so that a church can succeed in reaching the lost. So that is my goal tonight. I wanna to give you a 10,000 foot view of what a, an evangelistic church looks like. So it was the year 2020 and my family had uh, been um, uh, traveling and uh, we started in the month of June because for two months we weren't traveling. We didn't travel in the month of April or May. COVID had set in and uh, something happened during those two months that caught my attention. And up until that time, I was getting the report of two to three baptisms every single day. The churches were, were working, the evangelism was effective, and I could see positive steps being taken. But from, from April to May, I got zero baptisms reported. And in fact, I started reaching out to some of the churches asking, you know, how, how's your evangelism efforts going? And, Rob, we're not even open. Rob, we're, Rob, we're, 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 not, uh, we're not meeting. I don't know. And I, I received zero reports of baptism. That bothered me greatly. And so about June 1st, uh, I told my family, I said, we're going to get back on the road and we're going to train churches. And um, so I called the next church. It was the Covington Church of Christ, north of Memphis. And Brother Wayne Dalrymple, one of the elders, I said, Brother Wayne, I said, my family is scheduled to come and you're to enroll in this school and we're to train that church. He said, Rob, we're not even open. I said, Brother Dalrymple, I understand, but I'm coming anyway. I said, it doesn't matter how many people show up. I said, I'm going to come and train soul winners. And he paused just for a minute and, he, and then he said these words. He said, Rob, I'm with you. You come. He said, you come. He said, and, and I can't guarantee what's going to happen. He said, but I'll be there. Well, that's a church of about 250 members. I got there and 50 people showed up. And we fumigated and we sanitized and we separated and we did all we're supposed to do. And we're in this big auditorium. And I started that evangelism training. And from June forward, we trained 32 churches. We traveled up to Idaho, went to Nebraska and Kansas, came across to Missouri, went into New Hampshire, Ohio, down to Florida, Virginia, West Virginia. And we just keep training churches. And uh, it was one of the most exhausting years of our life. We, we, we spent very little time at home. And I can remember coming up to the month of August, and August uh, the 11th is our anniversary. And I looked at my wife and I said, honey, we need just a few days to unwind. I said, what do you think that uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll show up to, to St. Mary's, Georgia a little early, and we'll just take a few days and relax. And, um, and she says, well, that sounds like a really, really good idea. And she says, well, what are, you, what are you thinking about for our anniversary? I said, well, I said, honey, I've always wanted to go on a deep sea fishing trip. I said, would you like to do deep sea fishing? She said, you know, I'd like to try it. So I called Art Wilson. He's the preacher at St. Mary's. I said, Art, I'm coming in early. I said, um, I, I want to go deep sea fishing. Do you, do you know of anyone that will take us deep sea fishing? And Art says, you know, Rob, normally you couldn't get anyone because they're booked up. He said, but the captain, the best captain in our area, Rob, I believe you can get him because no one's doing anything. And so he gave me his number and I called him. And he said, sir, he says, I'll take you deep sea fishing. He says, and in fact, he says, I, I haven't done a lot of fishing this year. He says, and I really want to get back out there. And he says, all right. I said, I'll take you. I said, wonderful. I said, what time do you want me to show up? He said, three o'clock. I said, sir, that does not give us a lot of time for deep sea fishing. He said, oh, no, son, that's three in the morning. I said, okay, three in the morning. I said, sir, how will I know it's you when I get out there? It's going to be in the middle of the night. There'll be no, it'll be very dark. He said, son, I'll be the only one out there. And I said, okay. I said, so three o'clock in the morning, my family, my wife, my son, my daughter, my dad, we pulled into this, uh, we pulled into this um, arena and uh, 
There he is. He's got, his, he's got his boat, and he's got his first mate. He's a former Navy sailor, just got out. And, man, this guy is, he is quick. Whatever the captain says, on his word, he acts. And I, and I got a view of the helm of that boat, and I have, I'm a pilot, and I've seen navigational aids. I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware of modern avionics, and I saw something on that helm I've never seen. I said, it looked like I was looking at the space shuttle, something that NASA would put out. I'm saying, I said, that is a beautiful helm. He said, it's state of the art. He said, he said, I'll get you any fish you want. He said, by the way, what do you want? I said, I want the big stuff. He said, son, that's going to take you a while. I said, I've got two days. He said, all right. He said, you just hunker down. He said, I'll take you out there. And I noticed we, we, we pulled out of the harbor, right, and, and we're, we're passing the buoys. And finally, he, he starts to accelerate. And, um, you know, I'm really excited because I'm, I'm this first time in my life to, to get out there in the, the big ocean and, and do this. And uh, as we got out there and we're going, and hours pass, and I fell asleep. Finally, the sun pops up, kind of wakes me up a little bit, and I can see the captain and that helm again. He had instrumentation unlike I've ever seen um, and I'm looking at every, everything is perfectly placed. Everything in that boat had a place. And he, he throttles it back and he looks back at his first mate. He says, all right, we got to catch some bait. He says, uh, hey, let's get the poles in the water. Well, they had five poles perfectly stationed and everything was ready. And I looked at the captain. I said, captain, I said, where's the bait? He says, you're going to catch it yourself. So we put the poles in the water. He, he gets in this monitor and he's looking. He says, we're on him. He said, five, four, three, two, one. He pulls it up. And he's pulling that line up. And as he pulls the line up, fish are covering, bait fish. They're everywhere. And I looked at that captain. I said, how did you do that? He said, I've given my life. He says, I know how to go fishing, son. And I said, all right. He said, he said, now, son, he said, what is it you want again? I said, I want big fish. I want something that, he said, all right. He said, I think another hour will get us out where we need to be. He said, so he, you guys just kind of, just, just hunker down. So he, again, he throttles it up and we're going out and he, you can see him, he's watching these various monitors and we finally, you, you can tell we're getting close. He's slowing down. He says, all right, we're here. He looks at his, his first mate. He says, all right, first mate. He says, get them ready. The first mate looks at us and he says, who's first? I said, I'll go first. That, ca that first mate looked at the captain, and the captain says, buckle him in. Brother, I've never been buckled in before to fish. And, um, and he puts me in this chair. And uh, th th I, I would say the fishing pole was as, as thick as my arm. And, and, and so he's out there. He's looking. He's like, he finally says, all right. He said about, uh, about 5 o'clock, about, about 100 yards, 5 o'clock. He says, uh, and he tells the first mate exactly where the fish are. So the first mate gets the line out. He knows exactly how far to put the line out. He says, son, I want you to hold the pole. And, and the captain, again, begins to count down. He's counting down from 10. And he says, you're about right on him, right there. And all of a sudden, that pole went zzzz. And you could feel it. It was huge. He said, to give it, get it, let it take a little line. Let it take a little line. He says, set the hook. We set the hook, and then it began. I mean, it, 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 that, that, it's, it's way out there. He said, it's going to take you a little while. It took line for a long time. And I finally started, you know, started re, uh, reeling it in. I'm reeling it in. I continue to reel it in. And I'm looking out there. I said, Captain, what do you think it is? He said, I don't know yet, son. And he, I'm reeling it in. And finally, it comes out of the water. He said, son, you done caught yourself a kingfish. And I said, man, that's huge. He said, well, there's a reason we call it a kingfish. And so I'm bringing it in. And as I'm coming, I said, how are we going to get this thing in the boat? He's got hooks, right? And that back, back of the boat is, is comes down. And he's going to pull the fish in from the back of the boat. And I can see it. I mean, it's huge. And we're about to pull it in. Out of the left corner of my eye, something sails out of the water, comes down on my kingfish, and slices my kingfish in half. Captain. Well, what happened to my fish? He said, well, son, that's called a barracuda. He said, there's a reason we call them barracudas. I still had a fish this big. And um, we pull it in the boat. By 2 o'clock that afternoon, we had our limit. He says, we're going in. Brother, that captain knew everything about his trade. He had given his life to know how to catch fish. He had the latest technology. He had, he had the, the top of the line brands. 
He had the poles, the line, the lures. He had, he had the, the instrumentation, the boat. He, it, it, this, man was, this man was the best at his trade. I think tonight there are some of us sitting in our pews right now. We're more motivated. We're more prepared to go out and catch a catfish than we are to go fishing for men. I think there's some of us in the pews tonight that are more motivated to go out there and get the big buck. And, and when it comes to getting our bucks, man, we don't spare expense. We get the tree stand, we get the rifle, we get the, we get the camera, not just the camera, we get the Wi-Fi camera. But we can sit there in our, in our house and we know what time the buck comes. We got feeders, automatic feeders. We got our food plot. We got everything prepared to get the buck. It doesn't have a chance. You don't complain when you got to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's just part of it. You don't complain when that tree stand costs you $400. That's just part of it. You, you don't complain when you got to get out there and, you know, and, and till up that, that ground and plant that, get that food plot ready. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't complain when you, when you have to go through all the, the hoops just to get the one buck. I believe if more of our men would be as excited and as passionate to win souls for Christ. The church of Christ could turn things around. Brethren, I'm going to talk to you as men tonight. I'm glad the ladies are downstairs because this is about the men of the church of Christ. There's a war going on for the very soul of the church. And brethren, we have our toys. We got our boats. We got our rifles. And, and, the, and the world is lost. And the church is losing ground every single week. We will not win this without you. Gentlemen, it's time that you stand in the gap and you fight for souls. Harder than you fight for catfish. And with more passion than the big buck. May God bless us, men, to lead. May God bless us to put as much energy and fight into helping save the church of Christ as we do our hobbies. We said that Winston Churchill was one of the greatest orators in world history. 1937, 1938, 39, Adolf Hitler was taking his armies and he was pillaging and ravaging the land. He came up with a strategy called the Blitz. What he would take is his armies, and he did something the world has never seen. He would take his armory, his tanks, his soldiers. He'd take his aircraft, and he would go into a country, and as quickly as he could, he would mow it down. The world leaders begged Chamberlain, don't sign the treaty. He won't keep it. He signed it anyway, and he broke it. He got to the edge of France. And within weeks, he took the nation. World leaders did not know what to do with Adolf Hitler. The British people, for the very first time in a long time, feared for their very survivor. They didn't know if they were going to make it. Hitler took every country that, that, that uh, he attempted to take. No one seemed to be able to withstand him. The people were undergoing bombardments, aerial bombardments. The morale of the British people had never been lower. And Winston Churchill knew if something didn't change, they're going to lose the war. He was able to make a speech before the commons of Great Britain. It's called the Parliament. And the elected leaders came in to hear his speech. It's considered one of the greatest speeches in the world. I want to quote Winston Churchill. My fellow countrymen... We have no plan. And if we have no plan, we are planning to fail. We're going to lose this war. Gentlemen, I'm afraid in our churches, we don't have a plan to win the war. We are going through our routine. We've got our vacation Bible schools. We've got our Bible camps. But we're not winning this war. Our churches every single year are losing ground. 
So what I would like to do tonight in the next 45 minutes is I want to give you a plan. I want to give you something that you can take and that we can put into the pews of our churches and we can move forward as a united front and try to reach the lost in our communities. Take your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook, if you will, and I want you to, if you can, if you can turn with me, and I want you to go to page 100, and um, let's go to page 100, and 123. In fact, I'm going to switch something here just very quickly. 123, and I want to give you what I consider the 10-point plan for every congregation of our Lord to reach the lost in our communities. All right, let me pull that up right there. Let's start with number one. You gotta supply your troops with the tools they need to do the job. I believe this congregation has already done a very good job with that. If you're visiting tonight, I, I, need, I need to very quickly encourage you to make sure your church members have the equipment to do the job. Everybody who goes to the work has the equipment to accomplish their task. Carpenters have hammers and levels, and mechanics have pliers and screwdrivers. And, 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 and no matter what you do, if you're an engineer or if you're, you're in IT, you're gonna, they're going to make sure that you're equipped with the things you need to accomplish the job that they've given you. Well, our members cannot succeed if we do not equip them with the tools to do the job. What I've noticed in our churches is that when it comes to our fellowship halls, we are completely prepared. We got our coffee pots, coffee grinds, coffee stirs, coffee cups, coffee filters. We got our coffee creamer. We have everything we need for our coffee. And when it comes to making sure that our teachers have what they need, we have, uh, we have um, cardboard, we have poster board, we have Astro Bright paper, we have glue sticks and glue and map pencils and crayons and markers and scissors and don't forget the safety scissors and we have everything we need for our teachers my question tonight is do we have what we need for our members to reach the loss are we equipping the membership with the tools they need to do the job i'm not talking about jacob i'm not talking about the elders i'm talking about the membership brethren you must equip the members with the tools they need to succeed that's, that's the first thing you've got to do. Number two, you've got to put those materials where people can get them. You cannot lock them in an office. You cannot place them in a library. You cannot, you cannot uh, hide them in a corner. You've got to get them out where people can get them. I'm very impressed with this congregation already. They have an evangelism table. They've already taken the steps they need they began to purchase the materials over a year ago. They placed them out where the members can get them. If you're in a church and your members cannot gain access to the evangelistic tools they need to bring the loss to Christ, brethren, you have lost before you started. If your soldiers don't have combat boots and they don't have the proper attire and they don't have the proper munitions and they don't have the proper uh, 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 clothing, the, 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 the helmets and the things that they need to do their job, you're, you're, you've lost before the battle starts. And it's on the most basic level. We have to equip our soldiers with what they need in order to, to win the battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us about the war that we're fighting. We, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. This is not a physical battle. We, we, we're, we're, we're waging war, a spiritual war against the rulers of this world, the darkness of this world. And, and, and in, that, in that description, Paul, he outfits the Christian. He says, you've got to put your armor on. You've got to, some of that armor is for defensive purposes. But we've got to make sure we have what we need. We need Bibles. We need to make sure our people have access to Bibles. You know, we, we spend thousands of dollars overseas making sure that people have Bibles. There are people in West Plains, Missouri that do not have Bibles. Did you know that? You know, when Paul talked to Timothy, he said, Timothy, when you come see me, br bring my parchments, br bring my clothes. Even Paul needed equipment. Even the Apostle Paul said, there's some things that I need. Bring them. 
we got to make sure that our churches are equipped. So this is what an evangelism table looks like. You've got an example, a beautiful evangelism table sitting in your foyer. You've got to put it where people can get it. So number one, get the equipment. Number two, supply the equipment to the members. Don't hide it in the coat closet. I could tell you some stories about churches and how they, how they, they put it in the most in, they put it in the most inconspicuous places, and the members never know it's there. Wendell Winkler used to say the most neglected room in the church is the baptistry. The second is the library. No one goes there. If you put it in a library, they're not going to the library. When's the last time y'all went to the church library? Anyone? We just don't use them. So, so we put it out there in the foyer where people literally would have to trip over it. Or they'd have to trip over it in order, in order to get out of the building. They can't miss it. And so you place on that table things like a Bible study materials, like back to the Bible. You place on that table things that you could use maybe to make contact with people, like house to house, heart to heart. You place on that table maybe digital resources that can be used for people who, who perhaps would just take something and read it. Maybe books like Muscle and a Shovel. And so you just make sure that the, 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 the individual members have the equipment they need, number three. You train the church. How many of you have been to training for work purposes? Raise your hand. Anybody? How many of you have been, how many of you have had to travel outside of West Plains and you've had to travel maybe to a big city for that training? Raise your hand. How many of you have had to go outside of Missouri for that training? Raise your hand. Why do they do that? Why do, why do businesses send, why do they send their people? Uh, if you work for Toyota and you're in management, don't be surprised if they send you to, to Japan. Why? Why do they do that? Tell me. Exposure. Exposure. Okay. Do they have a certain way of doing things and they want to make sure you do it their way? And, 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 do, and, 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 and that training, do they want to make sure that you have complete understanding of, 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 of their techniques and their tools and their strategy? And, and how often you go to that training? Is it more than once? Are you going to do it maybe twice? Is it going to be annually? Is it going to maybe be quarterly? You're going to keep training? And how many of us have been working for companies for 10 and 15 years and we're still going to training? Now, let's bring it home. How many of us have ever been to a training class? that taught us what to do when a visitor walks in the door. Because I haven't. Brother, I grew up in the Church of Christ and no one ever taught me what to do. What happens when a visitor walks in the door? What are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to do? What's the end game? What's the purpose? What, what is it that we're trying to accomplish when a visitor walks in the door? We have zero training. How many of us have ever been to a training class and maybe, maybe here at this congregation you've done this, but uh, prior to about a year ago, let me go back a year, went to a class that said, okay, we're gonna teach you how to use an evangelistic tool like back to the Bible. And you're gonna go through a series of classes. And so, so maybe on Sundays or Wednesdays, maybe even Monday nights, we're gonna put you through a series of classes to train you how to use an evangelistic tool. How many of us have been to a class that, that trains us how to mentor new converts? Maybe, maybe a class that teaches us how to knock a door. I can tell you from going to a school of preaching, this was my training. Hey, boys, there's a stack of gospel meeting flyers up here on the Lord's table. Make sure you're respectful. Let's say a prayer. And remember, you represent the church. And uh, I want you to go door to door, hand out these flyers, and you can ask for a Bible study. That was my training. Brother, that's a recipe for failure. What I'm trying to suggest is I got, we, we get no training. When it comes to knocking doors, most of us show up at a building, the ladies make some breakfast, we have a prayer, we, we grab our flyers, we get in our cars, and we go door to door, and we, we have no training on what to say, what not to say, how to approach the door, what's the end game, what are we, what, how are we going to get there? We have zero training at all. And then we wonder why we fail. If your work, if your business, if your corporation, if they treated you like we treat our members in the Church of Christ, can you imagine if you'd have a job? We wouldn't make it. I cannot emphasize point three enough. One of the characteristics of a church that fails in evangelism is they don't train their members. 
There's no training provided. Jacob can preach the most powerful sermon in the world on evangelism. But after that sermon, if you don't sit down and train the church members, they're not going to do it. They're going to be excited. But I can tell you this seminar, if you liked it, if you didn't like it, if you learned something, if you didn't learn something. When I walk out the door tonight and I start traveling down Highway 60 to Cape Girardeau tomorrow, I can tell you that all the stuff that you heard, all the excitement that's been built, it is a complete waste if you don't train the church members what to do. Brethren, as much as I love preaching and I'm a gospel preacher, I know that a sermon by itself isn't going to create the culture we need in our church to succeed. You got to train your folks. We have to sit them down and we have to say, okay, here's what we do. What do we do when someone moves into our community? We call those new movers. What do you say to them? How do you approach them? Should you approach them? How do you find them? When we do find them, what, what is it we're going to do uh, when we meet them? What's our end game? And I, we could talk about contact after contact. I mean, how do you make contact with people in the community? How do, how do you let West Plains know that this church exists? If I were to take a poll right now in West Plains and I ask this question, how many of you know that there's a church of Christ, the West uh, 160 Church of Christ? How many of you know where it's at? How many do you know there is a West 160 Church of Christ? What do you think it'd be? 50%? I'm asking. 40? 70? How many people are in West Plains? What's your population? 20,000. 20, of those 20,000 people, how many people know you're here? Brethren, if we don't start doing some training, we will not grow. And so I, I can't emphasize how important this is right here. And we're going to spend a lot of time. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask your elders to spend the next three months working with individual members. I'm going to ask Jacob to participate in this because they're going to need your help. We've got to train from the pulpit. We've got to train from our Bible classes. And, and every, 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 anyone who's in the military goes through basic training. Is that true or false? Do the generals go to basic training? The colonels? The pilots, the snipers. Brethren, everybody's got to go through basic training. Brethren, we've got to put our members through basic training. Not everybody's going to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be a sniper. But you've got to, you're, you're going to, we're going to find your place. Everybody's going to have a place. Everybody's going to have something to do. And, and, and for some, after basic training, we're going to, we're going to put you in a, a place where, where you're going to be the best at what you do. And that's what the military does. Whatever it is, whatever your job assignment is, they're gonna, they want you to be the best you can be at that job assignment. So not only are they going to send you to basic, then they're going to have specialized training. So it's an avionics, you're going to have specialized training in avionics. If it's mechanics, and mechanics. If it's in flight school, it's flight school. If it's sniper, it's sniper. Whatever it is, if you're, if you're driving a tank, you're, you're going to get special schooling. But, but, you know, every industry does that. You know, you, you go to school to be a school teacher, <laughs> and, and, and the school hires you, you're, you're going to have more training. You're going to continue to get training. And you're going to get training that specializes you, maybe a special ed teacher. Maybe you're, you're going to get a specialized teacher in math or science or for, for certain grades. And, and so and, and here's, here's, a, here's a mechanical engineer right here, and a company hires him. Well, they're <laughs> mechanical. You can be a mechanical engineer at a, at a flooring company, but you can be a mechanical engineer at NASA. I mean, it's a very broad, it's a very broad field, as you indicated tonight. They're going to train you. They're going to make sure you're the best mechanical engineer that, that it's possible for their company. Brethren, we need to be the best we can be for the church of Christ. We can't just sit in a pew. So if that means we got to train you how to be a pew greeter, we're going to train you how to be a pew greeter. And that means we got to train someone how to be a door greeter. We're going to train someone how to be a door greeter. And we're not going to put angry Fred at the door. We're going to put angry Fred somewhere else, but he'll have a place. Be honest with me. I grew up in the Church of Christ. Brethren, I heard Guy Woods, Tom Warren. I heard Johnny Ramsey. I heard some of the greats. My dad took me to every lectureship there was. My grandfather's a preacher. 
My dad and grandfather served as elders. I, you couldn't get more inundated into the church. My mom was a church secretary. I went to the church every single day. That was my playground. I can't remember once getting training as a Christian in evangelism, not one time. Maybe it's my memory, maybe it's just faulty, but I can't remember it. How, do, how, will we, how, can, how, how can we expect our church members to succeed in evangelism if we don't take time as elders and preachers and, and, and learn it ourselves and teach them what to say and what to do? Brethren, I'm not blaming you tonight. It's cultural. We have to change the culture. We need to, these little boys need to be raised in a culture where they're trained how to be soul winners. Which means that we have got to learn how to be soul winners. That's the only way the church is going to grow. It's the only way we can address the problems we're facing. But I, I promise putting a, putting a sign out there that says, come and see, you know, you know, inviting, you know, waiting for people to come to the church building isn't working. Build it and they will come only works in the movies. They're not coming. Let's go to number four. We've got to promote an evangelistic atmosphere. I mean, we have got to promote an evangelistic atmosphere in our churches, which means that everything we do revolves around evangelism. Now, this is going to take a lot of thought. So as elders look out into their year, 2024, every event has to revolve around reaching the lost. So Vacation Bibles is about reaching the lost. So let me tell you a little bit about my work at Willette. I remember my elders and, um, Rob, we want you to direct a vacation Bible school. I said, that's great. And I've been going to the vacation Bible school since I've been, since I've been born. I know the songs as good as anybody. And, um, and I was thinking one, one, uh, one day in my office, I said, how could we make vacation Bible school an evangelistic event where we actually reached lost people? I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, but maybe I could look for visitors. So I'm sitting in the pew with my wife. We're getting ready to start. And I look behind me and this, this lady, she, she just sits down with three little, two little girls. And I look back and, uh, and I said, hey, my name's Rob. She said, well, my name's Rose. Hey, Rose. I, I said, are you visiting? Yeah. I said, uh, may I ask what, what, what your, why you came? She said, well, I always come to your vacation Bible schools. And I want my grandchildren to learn the Bible. I said, well, Rose, we're glad you're here. It's wonderful. And... Um, and uh, so, so uh, Miss Rose, uh, Phyllis Rose, fit Miss Phyllis. And uh, so Miss Phyllis and I started talking. And I looked at my wife. I said, this is what I'm looking for. I said, she would have, would she have come without Vacation Bible School? No. Why is she there? Because of Vacation Bible School. So do you guys do a Vacation Bible School here at this church? Do you guys do a Vacation Bible School where you attend? Let, let, me, let me ask a question. About, how many of you have been to a vacation Bible school? Raise your hand. Who comes to vacation Bible school? Yeah, but who else? The community. They, 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 bring, they, they will bring. I remember the first time I walked into VBS at Willette Church of Christ. I walked in. My mouth about dropped to the floor because there are hundreds of kids in there I've never seen before. I said, I looked at one of the elders. I said, where'd these kids come from? Oh, it's VBS time. I said, but where where'd they come from? I said, I've never seen them before. People come to vacation Bible schools. They're not going to come on Sunday. They're not coming on Wednesday night, but they're coming to vacation Bible school. I made it my goal to reach Phyllis. Every day we showed up, I talked to Phyllis. I built a rip. We ate together because we always eat in a vacation Bible school. Cookies and ice cream. And I'd sit with her. And um, I ignored everybody else. I can't, I can't do everybody, but I can do Phyllis. At the end of that VBS, I said, Miss Phyllis, I said, can I get your contact information? She said, sure, I live down here on such and such. I said, would it be okay if I came by and visited with you sometime? Well, you can come by, but be careful. My husband will cuss you. I said, cuss me. I said, well, why is that? Well, he don't like you. I said, we've never met. He don't like anybody. I said, well, okay. I said, I'll be careful. And um, so in any case, uh, I, I was a little bit timid about this, but I went over to her house, you know, after VBS. I knocked on the door, hoping she, she opens it up. She said, hey, um, preacher? I said, yes, miss. Let me get outside. She got out and quickly shut the door. And um, I said, Miss Phyllis, I just want to come by and see how you're doing. And I'm so glad you brought your, 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 your grandchildren to Vacation Bible. Oh, they loved it. She said, I, I said, well, Miss Phyllis, I, 
I was just wondering, uh, how much do you know about our church? She said, well, I don't know a lot, but you're the nicest people I've ever met. And I said, well, I said, I appreciate that. I said, I just was curious, maybe if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our church. And, and she said, well, you know, I kind of would. And um, she says, uh, you got something in mind? I said, well, I just so happen to have, let me see, these little booklets. And I said, I'd love to sit down. Oh, well, that'd be fine. And um, she said, now, she said, well, we could do it inside. Just give me a minute. She walks inside the house. I could hear commotion. She came back out. You can come in. And so I walked in, and there her husband was on the, on the, on the sofa. And there was more smoke than oxygen in the, in the, in the house. And um, so I went back to the table. We started our Bible study. We went through the study. We did study number one. And then I came back the next week. I had a, I had a silent partner. He's one of my elders. I brought him with me. So we did study number two. And we did study number three. We baptized her. After that baptism, I was excited because we had an evangelistic VBS. I started to think. We can change the culture in our churches to use Vacation Bible School to reach lost souls. It's, 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 it's more than just Sundays. It's more than just, it's more than just cookies. There are people coming to Vacation Bible Schools. So then I, I said, well, we've got to carry this to the next level. I said, Miss Phyllis, would it be okay if I met your husband? She said, well, I don't know about that. So I went over to meet her husband. And uh, he pretty much indicated to me that... Uh, that uh, it was okay for his wife to be at that church, but he had no intention to come until he had a heart attack. Guess who the first person was at the hospital? The Church of Christ. We, we, showed, up with, we showed up with cards and balloons, and we showed up with flowers, and we had a Bible study with him, and then we had another study with him, and then we converted him from a vacation Bible school. Brethren, when I'm talking about promoting an evangelistic culture, what I'm saying is that you've got to have events all year long in your church, but the thrust of every event is evangelism. The members have to realize that when people are walking in your church building, if they're not a member of that church, their job is to create that relationship, contact, and to, and to prospect that contact and to see if we can sow the seed. Let me give you a couple more examples of what this looks like. The Carnes Church of Christ is in Knoxville, 450 members. We're going to do a big campaign for them. We call it American Mission Campaigns. And so I called the elders. And I said, uh, one of the elders called me and he said, Brother Spencer, he said, hey, Rob, he says, we're thinking about doing a backpack drive. Y'all know what a backpack drive is? That's when you provide backpacks to the to children on the first day of school at the church. And it's a good way of just showing goodwill towards the community. I said, okay. He says, uh, he said, uh, we put one of our deacons in charge, and Rob, I'm, I'm thinking we might be able to learn a few things about how to make it evangelistic. When you get here, could you talk to this deacon? I said, sure. So we had 200 people coming. We showed up with 200 workers. We're going to work for nine days. I got there, and that deacon's there. And he said, Rob, come over here, and I'll show you my backpack. Brethren, they had more backpacks in that church building than Walmart has. We had crayons, and I mean, we were, they were completely prepared. Blew me away. I said, brother, what's your plan with the backpack? He said, oh, man, we're, we got codes. We're going to line them up out here. I think we can get through about, uh, I don't know, eight, 800 backpacks in a Saturday morning. He said, man, we're going to be just like Chick-fil-A. We're going to line them up, you know, and we're going to put the backpacks in the cars. They come by, give them a little track on the church. And he said, what do you think of my plan? Well, I commended him. I commended him for the work that was put into obtaining those backpacks. I commended him for the desire to do good in the community. But then I made a few suggestions. Why don't we put the backpacks in the classrooms inside the church building? Why don't we require people to walk into the church building, go to the classroom, and why don't we require the people to go meet the teachers where their children would attend if they came? Why don't the members of the church give the people who come a, I don't know, open house tour of your church building? Why don't our ladies have food prepared? And why don't we feed them when they're here, always eat? Why don't we have an information guide that we give them and then escort them out to the car? He said, we can't give out 800 backpacks if we do it like this. I said, no, you can't, but you'll, you'll baptize. And they did. We had a Bible study the very day we did it. That's what I'm talking about on point four. You have to change and promote your culture to be evangelism. Brethren, if we're just passing out backpacks to pass out backpacks, don't the Rotary Club do that? Are you the Rotary Club? Well, who are we? We're the Church of Christ. 
Our job is not to pass out backpacks. Our job is to, to connect and, 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 and love people and share with them goodness and kindness so that we can teach them the gospel of Christ. That's our job. Our job is not to, our job is not to be the local good, the goodwill. Our job is to teach people. That's what number four means. Let me give you another example. Hello? Yes, yes, this is the Willette Church of Christ. Yes, we do help people. Yes, ma'am, we do provide money for gas. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we provide food too. Yes, ma'am, we help with rent. Yes, we help with car payments. Yes, we help with mechanical issues. Whatever she asks is a yes. And then she says, man, I've been looking for this church all day long. She said, how can I get that help? I said, we provide it every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and we can't wait to meet you. Oh, no, sir, I just can't get there at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's a little early for me. I said, don't worry, we do it again at 10 o'clock. Oh, no, I just can't get there on Sunday morning. It's not a good, don't worry, we do it again at 6 o'clock, and we can't wait to meet you. Well, Sundays aren't just a good day for me. That's okay, because we do it again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I just can't, I don't have a car. Don't worry, we'll pick you up. You want to promote an evangelistic atmosphere in your benevolence work? You require them to come to the church building. You require them to come to a worship service. You get them inside your church building. You get, and when they show up, when they walk in your door and they say, they say, you know, your preacher said that you might be able to help me with my, 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 uh, my car. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. By the way, we have a special thing for you this morning. It's in room 101. Brother, you and your wife take them to room 101 and you do a Bible study with them. If we can't do a Bible study during Bible class, we've got a problem. I actually had someone raise their hand one, one seminar, and they said, Preacher, I think it may be unscriptural to do a Bible study during Bible class. That might be disruptive. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. We can't do Bible studies during Bible class. Mel Hutzler, San Antonio, Northern Oaks, they baptize about 20 people a year. I said, Mel, I said, tell me, if there's one thing, what's the, what's the one thing you guys do to baptize 20 people? He said, we do Bible study during Bible class. He said, when visitors come to our church, Rob, we take them to room 101, 102, 103, and we do Bible studies. By the way, how many of you would be willing to help someone with, I don't know, gas, if they did a Bible study? I would, but I'm tired of the charlatan ripping off the Church of Christ. Let me tell you what's not going to happen. The charlatan is not coming. Okay, they'd rather go to 20 other churches that don't make them do this. So what you do is immediately separate the sincere from the insincere. All we got to do is get them in the building. And so those are things that we do to promote an evangelist. I, I could spend the rest of my class on this point right here. But I just wanted to give you an idea and a flavor. Number five. We got to create contacts. So, by the way, here are just a few things that churches do in benevolence. You may be familiar with some of these, like backpack drive, teacher supply giveaways. Some have an entire building just dedicated to benevolence. Um, winter coat drives, we could use one of those. <laughs> Vouchers and pantry bo uh, blessing boxes and turkey giveaways. But if you make it evangelistic, what happens? You get this. And at Jacksonville, one of the first things I, I did when I got there is I said, listen, I said to the secretary and to the preachers, I said, listen, if, if someone calls for benevolent help, send them to me. And she did. And we said, Kim, we'll, we'll, we'll be glad to help you on Sunday morning. I don't have a car. I said, we'll, we'll pick you up. Miss Deb Rice picked her up, brought her to the church. We sat with her and got to know her. And, um, and, uh, she, uh, Kim, she came in a little late, so I couldn't do the study, but it's okay. After services, I said, Miss Kim, I said, uh, um, I know you need some groceries. Could we take you to get some groceries? She said, yeah, I really could use some. I said, well, let's go to the store. In fact, I said, have you had lunch? She said, no. I said, well, let's go eat. Always eat. So we sat at a restaurant. We ate a little food, went to the grocery store, got over to her apartment. Apartment was mold infested. I said, Kim, how long have you lived here? She said, about three months. And I said, well, have you had any health problems? She said, ever since I moved in. She says, all I can do is, she says, it, it, I, all I do is just, uh, I have a, this, con this cold constant. I can't get rid of it, Rob. I said, Miss Kim, uh, I, mean, I, said, um, I said, you have a serious mold problem, and let me make a phone call. So I called the, I called the, I called the place that owned it. It was a housing authority. I told them about the mold problem. Well, they sent out inspectors. They said, this, this place is unlivable. 
And they said, we got a brand new place we've just built and we'll, we'll, we'll let her live there. I said, that's great. Kim looked at me. She said, I can't move. She said, my family, she, she, they don't live here, Rob. I, I, I don't. I said, Kim, the church will move you. So the church, you know, we showed up on Saturday morning with our trucks and trailers. We moved Kim from one place to another place. And as my wife and I are sitting there on that couch, you know, with Kim, I looked over at Kim and I asked my three questions. You know what they are? Question number one, Kim, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Oh, I like it. Nice church. Kim, question number two, do you know a lot about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Don't know a lot about it, but y'all the nicest people I've ever met. Question number three, Kim, would you like to know more about us? Oh, I sure would. I just so happen to have, anybody? Someone help me. These little booklets. Guess what happens when you do that? You baptize them. Brethren, we did this 17 times. 17 times we did this over and over again. So we're very deliberate and intentional. Number five, you got to make contacts. And people have to know you exist. House to House, Heart to Heart is a colored magazine that's sent to the addresses of the people around your church. And I can promise you no one's going to come to your church if they don't know where you're located. And it's the most basic advertising principle. And so House to House is going to advertise your presence. And, uh, and in order to make this successful, there's some things we need to talk about that I'll do later. But this is a way to provide brand awareness. You've got people got to know you exist. And so you sit this into the home of every person in your community. It's very effective in that it provides people awareness of your presence. Now, as you, as you provide awareness, don't be surprised if someone visits someday. I looked over my left shoulder and Alan Webster was preaching. I noticed there was a lady that I'd never seen before. Alan finished his preaching and he walked back, he walked down the aisle. So I walked right with him and I looked, Alan, I said, who is that over there? He said, I don't know. She's visiting Rob. I said, wonderful. So I, I, I snuck in behind her. We have three different doors and I snuck in behind her and I sat on the back pew, closing prayers offered. She pops up and turns around and there I am. I said, ma'am, I said, my name is Rob. I said, uh, are you visiting this morning? She said, yeah. She says, uh, Hey, I am. She said, my name's Ellen. And I said, well, Ellen's really nice to meet you. I said, uh, Uncle, I, I, do you live nearby? I just live down the road. I said, are you by yourself? Well, my husband was with me, but he got sick this morning. So I just kind of came by myself. I said, well, Ellen, did you enjoy the service today? Well, you know, I did. I said, well, what did you like about it? She said, that preacher of y'all's. Boy, that man loves the Bible, doesn't he? I said, he does. Alan Webster loves the Bible. And uh, so we're just talking. I said, Miss Ellen, I said, I sure would like to meet your husband. She said, well, you know what? I want to come back. She said, do you have an evening service? Glad we weren't closed. I said, yes, ma'am, we do. We were one of the only ones who did. May I suggest something to those who are with us tonight? I don't know where you're located, but you will not become more spiritual by, more spiritual by worshiping less. We do not need to close our worship services. That does not help you grow. All right. We, we need to worship more, not less. And so in any case, we had, uh, we had um, uh, he, he, he said, I'll bring him back tonight. So sure enough, my, he, they, they came back. They sat on that back pew. My wife and I sat with them. We're talking and visiting. After services, I said, Ellen and Perry, we have a little custom here at Jacksonville. She said, well, what's that? I said, we always invite visitors out to eat. I said, Perry, where's your favorite restaurant in Jacksonville? He said, Athena's. I said, Athena's, wow. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, Athena's. I said, um, I said uh, Perry, we'll take you to Athena's tonight. Really? You take us? I said, sure. He said, man, if I want to, he said, my stomach's a little queasy. He said, if I'm going to go to Athena's, I really want to eat. I said, can you take a rain check to Tuesday night? I said, yes. Tuesday night, we show up at Athena's. Perry and Ellen are there. We, well, I could care less about the lasagna. I have one mission. I sit around the table, brethren, and I'm going, to, I'm going to prospect a little bit. That's all I'm going to do is I'm going to prospect. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what he likes. What, what is it that Perry loves? I said, Perry, what do you enjoy doing? You like NFL football? No, I don't watch that. They're disrespectful. I said, me neither. I don't watch it. I said, NBA basketball? Bunch of thugs. I said, they're thugs. I don't watch it either. And I said, Perry, what do you like? He said, nah, Rob, he says it's all about college football. Go, Alabama. Oh, no. 
Go Alabama. Brethren, if I've got to like Alabama football to get a Bible study, so be it. I don't really care. I go for the hogs. I go for Missouri. Brethren, all I want to do is connect with him. And I'm sitting there around the table talking, and we're having a great time. And I said, Perry, I'm so sorry. You've had a terrible season. You know what a terrible season is for Alabama? They lose one game. And uh, they didn't make the national championship. And I looked at Perry. I said, I'm so sorry, Perry. He said, I know Rob, it's awful for us here in Alabama. I said, Perry, do you know tomorrow's a national championship game? He said, I know. I said, you going to watch it? He said, well, you know, I'm going to watch it. I said, you know, we're having a football party at my house. Ouch, what was that? That was my wife kicking me because she did not know about this party. And, um, and I said, yes, we're having a football party at my house. I said, and you're invited. And uh, really? He looks at his wife and he says, honey, can we go to the Whitakers for the football party? She said, well, sure. And my wife, <laughs> she said, can I bring something? And she, Nicole says, no, I've got it covered. <laughs> Which means I've got it covered. <laughs> Y'all know about that conversation, don't you? So in any case, uh, so the next day they show up at the house. You know, we're sitting, uh, we're sitting in the living room watching the football game. It was a blowout. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. Not interesting. Halftime. Hey, Perry, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Why did you come to the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Listen to his answer. 21 years ago, you guys started sending us house to house, heart to heart. I read it every time I get it. All you guys talk about is the Bible. He said, my church doesn't follow the Bible anymore. He said, I'm looking for a church that does. I said, Perry, do you know a lot about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Not a lot, just that y'all follow the Bible. I said, Perry, would you like to learn more about the Jacksonville? He said, I really would. I said, I just so happen to have these little booklets. I always have the booklets because I have one mission. What do you think happened when we finished? Three weeks. That's what, those are two of the 17. Oh, but we're not done. <laughs> You got to advertise events, um, and uh, you got to put events in house to house that bring people. So, parenting seminars, marriage seminars, um, uh, th those bring people. Trunk or treats bring people. Backpack drives bring people. You got to figure out what will bring people to this church building, and you got to promote it and promote it and promote it. And if you don't promote it, they're not coming. Your members have to do it individually. You got to do it. You got to do it through the whole community because if you don't do that, they're not coming here. And so if you're going to bring Glenn and, and Cindy Colley in right here, every member of this church ought to have a handful of these and pass them out to everybody they know. If you're going to bring somebody in that speaks on these topics right here, every single person should be invited that you know. You put them everywhere, all over town, restaurants, post office, everywhere you go. You should hand these out and say, hey, we'd like you to come. Please, we're having a parent. Is it parenting? Is that what Glenn's going to do? Is he, gonna do is he doing a parenting seminar? Is that what he's doing? Uh, he does a lot of those. And uh, pass them out. Pass them out. Put them in the back of, of, of house to house. Events help bring people. Here's something else. Inside, you have these giveaways, these free giveaways, special offers. So when someone writes and said, hey, yeah, we'd like to have your, uh, we'd like to have that, uh, we'd like to have that book on marriage. Would you, would you send us the book? The last thing you guys should do is send it to them. What should you do? Hand deliver it. What happens if you hand deliver it? I'll show you what happens. You baptize seven people. That's what happens. <laughs> Deborah Rice, she calls me and she says, hey, Rob, we got someone wanting a, some marriage material. Should I mail it? I said, no, we've always mailed it. I said, and that's why we've not baptized. I said, we, we're going to hand deliver it. She said, well, I'll put it in your box, Rob. I said, when I get back, I'll go deliver it. My wife and I got back in town. Her name's Brenda. We went to Brenda's door. You always go with a woman. Fellas, never go to the door without a woman or a child. It's ethical. And I promise you, you're more effective with a woman. Man, when they see your ugly face, Jacob, they're not going to open the door. You scare them to death. But when they see maybe your mother with you or a teenage girl or take these two boys right here with you, right here. Take these two boys. Man, they'll open the door every time. And they're, they'll, oh, honey, these boys are here. And then as soon as they open the door, kind of move in. You know, that's what I do. And, um, and I say, hey, my name's Rob, my wife, Nicole, right here. And uh, so we're always going to make sure that uh, we have the best possible outcome. And uh, I said, my name's Rob, my wife, Nicole, and, uh, and uh, 
We're, uh, we're from house to house, heart to heart, and you asked for some marriage. Oh, yes, I did. I said, uh, ma'am, you're Brenda? Yes. I said, well, here it is. Thank you. I said, did you, just, did you just get married? I did about a month ago. Congratulations, Brenda. Well, thank you for that. I said, Brenda, where'd you move from? Oxford, just down the road. I said, Brenda, I said, who's the lucky man? And uh, Daniel, I said, well, I said, congratulations. I said, Brenda, do you know anything about the area? Well, not a lot. I said, well, let me tell you about Jacksonville. All I want to do is have a conversation with her. And so I just start telling her about the Jacksonville. And then she interrupts me. She says, uh, sir, who'd you say you were again? I said, my name's Rob, my wife. And I go, Rob, sir, she says, uh, do y'all have a church home? <laughs> do we have a church home? I said, yes, ma'am, we do, to Jacksonville. Where is it located? I said, right over there. He, she said, well, she said, sir, do you know anything about the Bible? I said, yes, ma'am, just a little bit. She said, good, because my husband knows nothing about the Bible. Daniel, get up. Daniel, she goes over to the couch. Her husband's dressing all white. She starts shaking her husband. Shakes him, shakes him, shakes He gets up. And he starts, he, he's doing this. She brings him to the door. He's six foot something. I know he's taller than me. And I'm looking at Daniel. And this is what she says. She says, sir, she does this. She says, she says Daniel, we're going to teach you the Bible. That's exactly how she did it. You could have blown me over. I looked at Daniel. I said, Brenda, when would you like to start this? She said, tomorrow. He needs to start tomorrow. I said, Nicole will bring chocolate chip cookies. Always eat. And uh, we baptized seven. After we baptized them, then they had a cousin, a friend, neighbor. Remember Geneva? She's on the bottom right. Isn't it amazing what happens when we just go to the door? Don't mail it. That would never happen if we didn't do this. You've got to make a target list. How many of you, I hope you do, you have a target list. Who's on your list? Who's on your list? Who, you, who, who, you, who do you want to bring to Christ? Put them on a list. Stare at it every day. You should have a list of people you want to bring to Christ. And we, we, we will never succeed if we have no targets. You'll never hit a target you don't aim at. Anybody who goes out hunting... If you bring back the big buck, you aimed at the big buck. It's not an accident. So we got to develop a target list. And these are just, again, I'm giving you a 10,000 foot view. We got to learn how to go door to door. We got to learn what to say and what not to say. We got to have some training <coughs> tools that to provide us how to do this successfully. We, we, we baptize people every year doing this. I, I, people, you know, door knocking doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work if you don't do it. And number two, it doesn't work if you've not been trained how to do it. Let me, let me demonstrate this. When you knock on a door, what do you want? What do you want when you knock on a door? When someone comes to the door, what do you want, gentlemen? Don't be afraid. I'm not gonna, I'm, I just want to hear, I want to hear when you go knock on a door and someone comes to the door, what is it that you want when they come to the door? <laughs> you look like deer in the headlights right now. Okay, Bible study. Thank you, Marvin. Bible study. All right. That's what I thought, too. Um, I don't know anyone that is qualified in the church to get a Bible study at the door. I don't know that person. Um, I always thought that my, my goal was to get the Bible study at the door. But unless I take it a football at the one-yard line and throwing it down to the end of the, end of the field, and uh, what do they call that, the Hail Mary? It don't work very often. It's just most of us aren't qualified to throw it that far. And if you are, it's just pure luck if it ever ends up working. David Shannon was with me one time, and he said, Hey, Rob, he says, uh, he's the president of Fred Hardman now. He was a preacher of the local area. He said, Rob, I think we do door knocking the wrong way. I didn't know because I would have given that answer. I said, What do you mean? He says, You know what I want when I go to the door? I said, What is it, David? A Bible study? He said, No. Why would they do a Bible study with you? Invite him to church? Why? Why would they come to church with you? I said, then what do you want? He says, just to make a contact. Just to meet somebody. He said, what if we took the pressure off the membership and said, when you go to the door, the only thing you have to do is just meet somebody. You know what our success rate did? It went from like 1% to 30%. This I I'm just giving you a taste of what training looks like. I got so much to talk about just in this one slide. I literally have a whole lesson on how to do this. But no one ever taught me that. 
Jacob, I was taught when you go to the door, you're trying to get a Bible. So I had to ask him, would you like to study the Bible? And I, and, and, and I was told if, you know, eventually we're, and, and we'd, all, we'd go back all day, all day we'd be at you, would you like to study the Bible? How many, how many Bible studies do you think we got? None. No, no, nobody's going to do it. So then you feel like a failure, right? It doesn't work. Let's not do it. We're wasting our time. It doesn't work. It worked in the 50s, not today. So now no one does it because maybe we were trying to throw the ball too far down the field. <laughs> That's not even realistic. But if we teach our members how to make a contact, you can do that. The strategy, we have five strategies we use at the door. We have five. And... Um, we have tried these all over the country. I've tried these in big cities, little cities, and country churches. The average rate of success when we use our strategy is 30%. That's the average rate. That means out of every 10 people you talk to, three of them become a contact. If you knew, brother, if you knew that you could go talk to 10 people and get three contacts, would you spend time doing that? Yes. But if you knew you're going to go out, and you're going to work all day long. At the end of the day, you're probably not going to get any contacts Would you do it. You don't want to waste your time. I'm trying to demonstrate the value of training. So what we have to do is train people to a point where they, they can see success. People don't like to waste their time. I don't. I want to teach you how to do this. What about new movers? Guess how many people are moving into the White Plains community every single month? I looked it up this morning. I did this. Not just around your, I'm talking the White Plains. Guess what? You have 33 people moving into White Plains every month. 33 families moving into White Plains. What if you were the first people to knock on their door and say, welcome to White Plains? My name is Marvin Hatley. This is my wife. And uh, we've lived here all of our lives. We think it's one of the best cities in America. And we just wanted to say welcome. And we have a gift basket for you. Where are you from? You, would that make a difference? Jacob, do you think that would make a difference in someone's life? What, what, if we, what if as a church we had a strategy of like what to say at the door? We taught you what to say. What if we even taught you what not to say? Because there are some things you should not say at the door. They're going to get you in trouble if you say them. And you're going to do it if I don't teach you. What if we, sh we, we shared with you what to take to the door? And even give you a... Shopping list, which my wife is giving your ladies right now. Did you know my wife is teaching your women right now how to go shopping in the name of the Lord? They've never done this before. It's God-authorized shopping. They're excited. They're going to come up here after service, and they're going to say, we're going to shop in the name of Jesus. And they're going to ask the elders for help. And they're going to have a, a list, and they're going to go to Dollar Tree. They're going to go shopping. Brethren, everything I'm going to teach you about this, it works. Reaching the lost tomorrow morning. Read through those reports how many churches baptize someone because of this. Every month you have 34 people moving here. Should you not be the first church that knocks on their door? We're going to give you their name and address. Then we're going to train you what to bring to the door, what to say, what not to say. Let's keep going. That's compassion cards. Very effective when you do it right. I know you guys are already sending cards. We just might want to say a few words about how, just really learn about how you're doing it, but maybe offer a few suggestions, how to make it more effective. You should be sending two to three cards a day per contact prospect. And um, you should be tracking them. In other words, after three weeks, you should know so that you can go visit them. It's very effective. In reaching the lost, every week you have baptisms because of this. If it's done properly, it's done correctly. So we've got to train you how to properly do compassion card. It's a congregational work. Everybody in the church does it. This little boy can write a compassion card. He can do it. We actually have cards for children. And, uh, but, you know, us older, older ones can do it too. Everyone can write a card. I mean, who, who can't write a card? The person who doesn't care. That's who. Just be blunt. I mean, I, I, we're asking you to write a card, and, and, and we're asking you to reach out and love people who need love. They got cancer. Tell them you're praying for them. You know, they, they're having surgery. And just let them know that, you, you know, you know you're, we're here for them if they need something. And that, give them a, a scripture. Say, say something kind. 
But everybody can do this right here. And when you do this, what happens? Look at her. When I walked into her apartment and she had cards all over the apartment and I sat down in her apartment, her name is Bettina. My wife and I sat in her apartment and all I could see was cards everywhere. And I said, Miss Bettina, I'm Rob, my wife, Nicole. Are you from that church sending those cards? I said, yes, ma'am. Oh, I've been so wishing you'd come see me. I've got 47 cards in my apartment. She knew how many, Jacob. You know why, right? They're important. She reads them every day. Can't wait to go to the mailbox every day. <laughs> I'm sitting in her apartment. How hard is it going to be for me to get a Bible study? How hard? Not hard. You know what I did? I looked at her. I said, Miss Patina, y'all ready for the questions? Y'all should know these by now. Question number one. What do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Well, that's the nicest church. Y'all have sent so many cards. I really needed them. I've had a hard time. Number two. Bettina, do you know a lot about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Not a lot, never, not, not a whole lot. Number three, Bettina, would you like to know more about the Jacksonville? Oh, I sure would. Let me see if I can do that. I just so happen to have, anybody? These little booklets. Here you go. There you go. It's your own set. We'll get him ready. We baptized her. Hey, Alan, I need some help. She's in a wheelchair. Will you help me? I'll be right there, Rob. We did this 17 times in a year. The elders told me when I got to Jacksonville, Rob, we believe in what you're doing. The members don't. You have to prove it to them, Rob. I said, it won't take long. Give me one year. I said, Alan, give me a list of everybody that you know of that's lost. I'll start with your list because I didn't know anybody. And I started on his list. We just went right down the list. It's amazing what happens when you evangelize. Visitor bags. You got to get ready. So a study was done not long ago, and the study said this. How many visitors do you guys need every week to grow? A congregation of 100 needs three to five visitors every week to grow. Every week, you need three to five visitors. How do you... So if you're a church of 50, you need one to... You know, one to two visitors, one to, one to two visitors every week to grow. So, first of all, we need to know that. Second of all, then we have to ask, how do we get people to come? How do we get visitors? So, we're going to work on that. And, and we got to be ready for when visitors walk in the door. So, a survey was done. Um, Pew Research Center. Have y'all heard of Pew Research? They do polls. And they're a professional polling firm. And the Pew Research Center asks a question to religious people only. When you visit a church, what's the number one thing you want when you walk in the door? What do you think it is? How friendly. How friendly. I, like that. I like the answer. What do you think it is, Adam? Andy stole yours. Anybody have another answer? So you walk into a church. Now, let, me, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Anybody here ever travel like on a Sunday or Wednesday and visit a church? Anybody ever visit another church? When y'all visit another church, Craig, when you visit another church, you and your wife, and y'all walk in the door of a strange church, you don't know anybody, what do you want to do when you walk in? You know, that's the number one answer, sit down. That's the number one answer, Craig, sit down. It beats friendliness by threefold. They just want to sit down. So if we know the number one thing a visitor wants to do when they walk into a church building is sit down, what should we let them do? What should we help them do? Find a seat. So we should have door greeters at the door that immediately point them to the auditorium where they can sit down. But you know what a lot of our churches do for visitors? I know because I, I go to them. They have the welcome center, literally on wheels. They wheel it out into the foyer. And they have all these people just ready, hovering when a visitor comes, just, just ready for you. And when you walk in, I literally walked into one church. It took me 15 minutes to get through the foyer. And then the preacher, we're a real friendly church, aren't we, Rob? I said, yeah, you are friendly. But it's not what they want. They do not want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be identified like that. They just want to sit down. Every poll, every poll says the same thing. Lifeway just did a poll too. It said, sit down. So if they want to sit down, let them. So we should have door greeters, but we should have, maybe we should have some pew greeters. Highly trained members. Highly trained. They know exactly what to say, where to sit, and what to do. 
They have a gift bag made by the ladies. Right now, my wife is teaching your ladies how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. They're going to do it again. And we're going to have bags ready when a visitor walks in the door. And you know what we're going to do when they walk in? We're going to sit down. Remember what I did with you, Jacob? Remember I talked about you visiting? I got the visitor bag. And, you know, everybody needs to know their mission. So if you're a, a, a pew greeter, what's the, there's, there's one primary thing you're supposed to do. One thing I need you to do. If we don't know what that one thing is, we won't do it. The one thing I need you to do is get their contact information. If they leave without a name and address, you fail. You ab- How do we traditionally get a name and address of visitor? Let me show you. Um, if you're visiting this morning and sitting in the pews, on the back of the pew, you'll find a visitor's card. If you take that card, fill that out, put it in the collection plate where I have a record of your attendance. We're thankful you're here. Is that what we normally do, something like that? We did this for a long time. Do they fill those cards out? Do the visitors fill the cards out? No. Do they want to fill out cards? No. But if I give you a gift and I sit down in front or behind you and I engage you in conversation and I, and I, and I begin talking, and if I look over and say, oh, by the way, we're a card-sending church. We'd like to send you some cards thanking you for coming. Can I get your name and address? Guess how many times I get it. Eric Sykes told me they up in Baltimore, he said, Rob, we get it every time. He said, what is your rate? I said, 99.9. But if I do a attendance card, how often do I get it? (laughs) Hardly at all. So so our, 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 our pew greeters need to know what? What is your primary objective? It's to get contact information. Who are the pew greeters? Well, you need to select them, elders. That's your job. You need to look out to your, your, your congregation and say, okay, we need this family and this family and this family, not them. No, 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 no. That's not their, that, that's not their. But this family, yes. They could talk to a brick and it would smile at them. They're very good at it. So you have to, and we're going to train them on what to say and what to do. And so, so at, at every stage in this congregational model, we're developing it. How long does it take to do all this stuff? You going to do it all tomorrow? How, how long does it take to eat an elephant? How do, you, how do you eat an elephant, everybody? Who knows the answer? One bite at a time. So we're going to take one thing at a time, and we're going to develop it. And then we're going to do the next step, and then the next step. And we're going to help you get there. And someone says, one elder raised their hand in a meeting. He said, Rob, when are we going to finish all of this? I said, when Jesus comes. Because the day I stop evangelizing is the day I stop living. My mission is to reach the lost. I never stop doing it. Never. It's a culture. It's who I am. It's who you are. It's who we ought to be. I wish I had time to tell you about this family. They walked in the church building first day. Keith Ritchie's a new preacher. When Alan stepped down and went to Memphis School of Preaching, and um, Keith didn't know a visitor from a member. I walked up to Keith. Hey, Keith, I said, that family back there is, a, is visiting. He's, he looks at me and says, Rob, I've been through your school twice. I know what to do. Where are the bags, Rob? He said, where are the bags? I said, they're back there. Keith, Keith walks up. He had him at, he had him at uh, Baja that afternoon eating lunch. Monday night, he had his first Bible study. Two weeks later, he had his first baptism, baptized the husband and the wife. He did exactly what he was trained to do. Got to take people out to eat. It's very important. And if you want to have Bible studies, always eat. Have them over to your house. Take them out to eat. It works. I promise you, you want to do that. We've run out of time tonight, but I did want to give you a flavor of kind of what a congregational plan looks like. There's a lot more I'd like to cover, but... uh, if you are interested in more information, all you got to do is let us know if you're from a visiting church. I'm going to be meeting with your elders tonight and, 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 and uh, Jacob, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about how to implement this one step at a time. You've already done some good things here at this church. I'm very thankful for the work you've done. You've had some baptisms. I just think that with this training, you're going to take it to an, another level. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you for your, your kind attention. Thank you for allowing us to be here. We do love you. We will be praying for you every day. And um, I just want the church to grow. And uh, I know with good brethren like this, 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 this war is far from over. And um, if God be for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time together as the men of the church. Father, we pray for courage. Help us, Father, have the strength to do what is right and good. Bless us, Father, in that which is good. Help us to reach the lost. Defeat us, Father, in things that 
that, that are wrong. We pray for the growth of the church of Christ. Pray for these elders, Father, that they would have wisdom as they lead the flock. And bless the men here at this church to lead their homes. And we pray, O oh God, uh, that uh, every day of our lives we'd be looking to, to reach those who don't know thy son. Forgive us of our faults and fail, failures and our sins. And one day, Father, would you gather us together again in heaven. We love thee, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.